it's amazing how much green space we've lost in Canada in the last 20 years around our major urban areas and cities. Welcome to Northern Latitudes. I'm Bill Alt, and today I'll be talking to the man the Toronto Star calls Canada's Indiana Jones, best-selling author and explorer Adam Schultz. Adam Schultz is a historian, archaeologist, geographer, and Westway explorer in residence at the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. Schultz holds a PhD from McMaster University, where his research examined the influence Indigenous oral traditions had on the fur traders in the subarctic and Pacific Northwest. The author of A History of Canada in Ten Maps, Alone Against the North, Beyond the Trees, and most recently, The Whisper on the Night Wind, all of them national bestsellers in Canada. Welcome to Northern Latitudes, Adam. Oh, my pleasure, Bill. Thanks for having me on the show. The tagline for Whisper on the Wind is a true history of a wilderness legend. Tell us a little bit about the legend that took you into the untamed wilderness of Labrador. Yeah, I mean, this was a little bit different than any of my other expeditions or adventures I'd ever done. I was doing some research, which I often do, reading some old fur traders' accounts, uh, their diaries from 100 years ago in Labrador. And uh, for the most part, the entries in the diary are pretty ordinary stuff, you know, tales about hunting caribou and trapping beaver and chopping firewood and dog sled teams and that sort of thing. Uh, but there was one entry in the diary that was like, unlike anything I'd ever encountered before, immediately made me sit up in my chair and take notice. And uh, the author of the diary, a fur trapper by the name of Merrick, he described um, finding strange tracks in the woods, unlike anything anyone had ever seen or even heard of, uh, calls in the night that would echo out of the forest, and most alarmingly of all, sled dogs that went missing uh, with no explanation. And he gave a lot more details. And the details, uh, I mean, I'd come across these kind of... Uh, you know, stories, but nothing like this. I mean, this was really something else. And I'm naturally a skeptic. You know, I take these kind of stories with a big grain of salt. But by the end of reading through this thing, I felt, wow, something really did happen here. I mean, maybe it was a hoax. Maybe it was some elaborate hoax. Uh, but there was clear that something, there was a story there, and I wanted to get to the bottom of it. So I ended up packing off, packing up my backpack and setting off for the wilderness of Labrador to see if I could investigate this old legend and hopefully unravel it and tell the story of my book now like you said these these legends exist and you you mentioned in the book actually you mentioned about them existing in what do you call them northern forest based cultures they're so prevalent like across you talk about northern europe and you talk about canada and everything else what is the what do you think the reasons are for that based on your background and also can you tell us about a few of the others that do exist in Canada and what you might might have thought at one point at least what this one was in Labrador yeah I mean so in my book I explore sort of um, the similarities and the parallels in folklore found all over the northern world wherever you have um, forest boreal forest or subarctic forest coniferous forest whether it's in Russia or Finland or northern Germany Sweden Norway and all across North America, from Labrador to the Yukon to Alaska, um, it seems that across all these different cultures, like the Vikings or other Germanic peoples, Russians, um, indigenous people, different indigenous cultures here in North America, you have similar legends of large cannibalistic beings that stalk the northern forest um, and that you would want to avoid if you could. <laughs> and I, I, well, I speculate in the book, you know, why are these such striking parallels? between these different myths all over the northern world and you know what what inspired them and it's possible the landscape itself um the ecology of that place uh in the past is part of the reason why they had such a harsh folklore um i mean they're kind of stories you can imagine centuries ago gathered around the campfire in the woods listening to you know your grandmother tell you these kind of stories that if you stray off the beaten path or if you go out into those mountains uh, there's something out there that's going to get you. It's going to eat you alive. Now, maybe you could say there's a good evolutionary reason for telling those stories around a campfire, especially to young children, so they learn their lesson uh, not to go into those mountains or to get off the beaten path uh, because bad things really could happen to you. And I think, you know, conditions, especially if you look at the archaeological record, they really were incredibly harsh historically. Um, you know, if you had a really harsh winter, that could be the difference between a successful 
hunt in a failure, especially if the uh, prey species you're relying upon, well, their population might crash. You know, snowshoe hare every nine years or so, the population crashes. Same with caribou and elk and other animals. So this was something, this was just the grim, brutal reality that humans in these northern environments had faced uh, for countless centuries that every once in a while uh, there might be a famine. And out of those famines, there could come very desperate choices that had to be made. And maybe that's partly why they had these legends of things like uh, Baba Yaga, witch eating cannibals and Wendigos and other monsters like that in the North Woods. Maybe it reflected uh, the dim memory that had been preserved in oral tradition culturally of a famine that had happened once and some people really had turned into cannibals in order to survive. So I get into those kind of um, legends and history in the book, but ultimately I think what happened in Labrador a hundred years ago where all these sightings took place was something quite different, but I really wanted to try to explain or explore every aspect and really do a thorough investigation um, before coming to some sort of conclusion about what I think it was that was happening there a hundred years ago. Yeah. And it, it it's, a, the book is riveting. It's spine tingling. It, it's a real thriller. I mean, it really is. I mean, I've read it twice now. Wow. Um, to prepare for Well, to prepare for this. Cause I, I, you know, I, you, so I, I've loved all your books, but this one, I, I it is, it's a spine tingling thriller. And you've, you, you've brought across the, the feelings of, you know, being out on your own in the woods and even you don't have to go to uh, Northern Labrador to get that feeling. You can go to Algonquin, you can go almost anywhere and get that feeling of suddenly you're a very small part of a very big world. But the spine tingling thriller part of it for me is really exciting because it's it's Canadian history. And I, I, I honestly, I don't recall which book you put it in. I, it may have been a uh, Canada and 10 Maths uh, or History of Canada and 10 Maths where you said that Canadian history is underappreciated because we teach the boring stuff. Yeah, that sounds like a history canon 10 maps. I mean, I basically, I wanted to dedicate that book to anyone who ever had to sit through a boring history class. Um, and I know many of my friends, uh, that's what they tell me. You know, we don't like history. History is boring. Um, it was nothing exciting about it. And I always felt that that was a real shame, um, that there was absolutely no reason for Canadian history to be taught in that way, that Canadian history could be, every bit as exciting as like Game of Thrones, like this epic struggle that played out across half a continent, a, a clash between empires, um, you know, thick with dark plots and conspiracies and mutinies and murders and wars and incredible adventures and survival stories. And I really wanted to try to do justice to that in History Canon 10 Maps to write a book that would read like a, a page turner, a thriller, where you want to know uh, what's going to happen to Champlain or Franklin or Thompson. You know, what are they going to find around the next bend or over the mountain? Are they going to survive? Um, you know, turn it into this this thrilling account, um, this epic tale that played out across a dramatic landscape spanning thousands of miles from the coast of Labrador to the Arctic to uh, the Pacific Northwest rainforest. And that's what I tried to do in the book, History Canon 10 Maps. And my new book, The Whisper on the Night Wind, is sort of similar, where I've again gone into the pages of history and I've tried to tell the story in a, in a different way than a sort of boring, dry history book. I've tried to take history and turn it into an adventure. And I'm hoping that if uh, people read the book, they get the same sense of excitement, that it's a bit of a mystery, a thriller, where you're trying to race to the end and find out what's going to happen um, in this, this historical story. I think you've accomplished that amazingly well. And I mean, if you, you know, if for a day you were in charge of teaching history in Canada, what would you do? What would one thing you would do? Like just one thing you would say, hey, let's do this. Oh, that's the time. Read your books. Yeah, I'll <laughs> sign all my books to the curriculum, or at least in some kind of maps. That's yeah. Well, I always say so. My advice to history teachers or historians or anyone who writes history books is that the first rule of history is don't be boring. Right? Life is short; it's over in the yeah. blink of an eye. We have such a short amount of time on this earth. No one has time to be bored. Right? There's no excuse for it because history is full of fascinating stuff. And even if you live ten lifetimes. You could never even come close to reading all the books in a library. So you have to focus on what's interesting, right? So the first right. rule of history, I would say, is don't be boring because nobody has time to read it all otherwise, right? And there's no reason for it because history is so full of fascinating details. So I always, I'm always super conscious of that when I'm writing my books. I'm like, I don't want to abuse my reader's patience. Um, if I'm not being exciting and interesting and engaging, they have every right to throw this book away and go do something else with their time. And it sounds incredible, but
But when I was in academia, I was amazed by how many of my colleagues did not share that view where they thought, well, you know, they kind of looked down their noses on the idea that you had to be interesting to write history, right? It was this very sort of um, academic view where it didn't matter how boring it was. In fact, some of them had the attitude that, you know, the more boring it is, the better it is. The better, yeah. Um, you know, if nine people read this book and it collects dust on a shelf, all the all the better, right? But my idea was the exact opposite of that, which is I wanted to make my books as accessible as possible and to appeal to the widest possible group of people from all walks of life. In fact, the one thing that I find really gratifying is whenever I hear from people who tell me that they don't like history, they don't like maps, and they would never read a book like that. But they ended up stumbling upon my book and they really enjoyed it, which is what I was hoping to, you know, reach people who never found history that interesting, but all of a sudden they're like, wow, this really sparked my interest. It whetted my appetite. And now I want to read more and learn more. So I get emails all the time from people who are like, I loved your book. Can you recommend other books? Or I want to know, you know, how can I get my hand on some of these diaries or journals you reference? Um, yeah. Because it just sort of opened up this whole new avenue to them. And they realized this is not the boring story I thought it was. There's so much more here that I want to explore. And to me, I think that's a very exciting thing when you've introduced someone to a subject and now they want to know more about it. Now, you mentioned maps. And in the front of The Whisper on the Night Wind, there's a map there. Now, is that just an illustration for the book or is that an actual existing map? Well, that's actually a map I drew uh, okay. myself for the book. Um, yep. I figured that this book was a little bit different in style and tone than any of my others. So I wanted the map to be a little bit different in style and tone as well. Yeah instead of just having an ordinary map that we could print in the book, I was like, well, why not do something a little more artistic? Let's make this kind of like a fantasy map that you would see in Lord of the Rings or something yeah. uh, when we actually yeah. draw on the mountains yeah. and all this stuff to give, give the reader a sense that you're actually embarking on this, this great adventure, right? In this mysterious land, which is Labrador. So I decided to, to go in a slightly different direction and draw the map of my route. Uh, well, I assume that's what it was because there, there was no credit for the map. So I assume this is a map that's for illustration purposes. But maps, obviously, for somebody like you who you know goes solo across the Arctic and you know canoes in the Hudson Bay Basin and does all these things, maps are obviously very important to you, not just from a historical point of view, but from an actual practicality point of view. You use them all the time. So two things about maps. One is... What's the, I don't know whether to call it the history of the map in Canada, but can you tell me like anthropologically, I guess, from when the natives, what the natives did, we know we get a pretty good vibe for the explorers and that sort of thing. And now modern day we're satellites and GPS, which in another one of your books point out still doesn't do the trick all the time. But how did it start with like, say the native people? Yeah, so maps are actually incredibly ancient. Um, they're older than the oldest writing in the world, and they're older than the oldest cities. They've been around for tens of thousands of years. In fact, maps may be the oldest example in the entire world of abstract human reasoning, um, the ability to sort of reproduce things uh, in an image. And that comes from um, cave drawings, you know, some of the oldest cave drawings that date back many thousands of years, more than 10,000 years, are actually maps. Uh, etched into the walls of a cave, but that's relatively rare. I mean, we have to think that for every time someone etched a map into stone on the wall of a cave, there was probably a thousand examples where someone drew one quickly in some type of perishable material like birch right. bark or snow or dirt or sand, and then it, it washed away with the elements. But um, we know that indigenous people here in Canada were making those kind of maps for probably thousands of years because when Europeans came over, um, they frequently asked their indigenous guides to make maps for them, and they, they did so um, very easily. I mean, they, it wasn't like some foreign concept to them. Uh, there are many examples of that in the Hudson's Bay Company, in the fur trade, or Champlain, Franklin, asking an indigenous guide, can you draw me a map? And they would, either on birch bark or right with a stick in the sand, or sometimes they simply gave them their pen or their quill and a piece of paper, and they made like a masterful map of the surrounding right. area, or they mapped out the coastline. The Inuit in particular, um, historically had a reputation as being really excellent map makers who were like among the best at uh, recalling entirely from memory, a very detailed outline of uh, the lakes and the rivers and the coastline. And back in the 1800s, uh, many whalers who actually went up to the Canadian Arctic to hunt whales 
asked uh, some of the Inuit people they would meet with to map out the coast for them, which they knew quite well from traveling in kayaks and by dog sled teams and that sort of thing. And there, there are some examples. I mean, most of these maps, as you can guess, just like most historical records have not survived the ravages of time, but there are some precious examples that have been preserved in archives um, in Ottawa and Winnipeg and elsewhere from the 1800s where we can look at some of these maps. Um, and a lot of them show a really impressive attention to detail. So, you know, maps have been used for thousands of years, but many of them um, obviously have not survived the ravages of time, especially in Canada, uh, where we don't, for the most part, have the, the climate and the conditions to preserve those kind of materials. Some of the oldest maps that have survived are in totally different climates like Egypt, uh, where you don't get a lot of precipitation. It's very hot and sandy. So they've actually been able to find uh, ancient Egyptian maps, like papyrus maps that are three or 4,000 years old, uh, buried in the sand that come to life, come to light on archaeology digs and that sort of thing. Here in Canada, that would be a lot harder to find something like that, but I don't think there's any real doubt that they did exist at some point in the past. And nowadays, you know, to get, you know, we have GPS and we have satellites and we have our laps and everything. So we're all wandering around. You're obviously not able to use that most of the time because you're in a place with no satellites or, well, sorry, no GP, uh, no cell service. And um, so maps are still really important to you. How important do you think they are to, or should they be, I guess, to say to even your general person, your person going out, you know, in Algonquin Park, for example, how important is it to know how to use a map? Well, I think, well, I think there's no doubt whatsoever that maps are still hugely important in the 21st century and that almost everyone directly or indirectly is dependent upon maps. We just don't really think about it because a lot of it is computer mapping now. Um, so it's done automatically by GPS and stuff. But I mean, if you think of, if you've ever been on an airplane or if you've ever ordered anything that came from an airplane, just think of all the flights, the thousands of airplanes that are flying around in the world and what keeps them on track uh, from colliding with each other. I mean, it's incredible how many flights come in and out of major yeah. cities like New York and Toronto and Los Angeles. All of that has to be very precisely mapped using computers and things um, to keep that functioning. So that's an example that affects virtually everyone. If you have anything in your house that came from overseas uh, and how mapping is still essential to that process. And of course, anyone who's ever got behind the wheel and driven somewhere and they needed a Google map or a GPS or something to give them directions, that's another example of continuing to use maps on a day-to-day -day basis. But if you're going back into the backcountry of Algonquin Park or any other wild place, um, a map is definitely a good skill to have. And it's something that on a different level is also enjoyable. I think there's a added element of fun that comes with doing things with a, a paper map and a compass rather than just relying on an electronic GPS map uh, to do everything for you. And I feel like there are still some real advantages over a printed topographic map or a printed map over a GPS. One of them is the sense of scale. Uh, for the most part, the GPS is small. It's a very small screen. It basically fits into the palm of your hand. So it doesn't necessarily give you a very good sense of the general area that you might be traveling in, in a canoe or, uh, or hiking through. Like you have to kind of zoom out and fiddle with this little tiny screen, but then when you zoom out, you lose all the detail. And when you zoom in, you get detail, but it's only in a very tiny area. So that's where the beauty of the, the old traditional map comes into play because you can spread out this much larger map that'll take up like your kitchen table, but you can easily pack and bring with you in the canoe and spread out around your campsite at night. And that will give you a new appreciation for the area in your vicinity, like a radius of 20 miles or 50 miles, however the, big the map is. And oh, yeah. uh, it really helps you to visualize things and plan things, even on a not just a romantic, but a practical level. Um, it gives you a bird's eye perspective where you can say, OK, look at this lake. This is interesting. I think we could, you know, ca canoe up this bay to the north here. And if we do a portage, we can get into some of these interior lakes and maybe the fishing is going to be really good in there because it looks off the beaten track. Nobody goes back there or look, there's a shortcut here. We can portage to this lake and then this lake and we can get over there. Um, so it gives you a really good perspective on all these different kinds of things that you can't get as easily. Uh, necessarily from the GPS screen in the palm of your hand. It's it's interesting because there's been so much technology come into this in the last 10, 15 years, whether it's gear or whether it's, like you said, GPS or, you know, everything, like the, the materials we're wearing, everything has changed so much, even just in the last decade. 
reading your books, you know, that originally you, you know, you were kind of just pulling together whatever you could to make these trips, you know, whether it was a used tent or a used sleeping bag, it didn't matter. You just wanted to get out there. Now it's changed a little bit for you over the years, but A, what do you think the biggest technological change has been for you out there? And what is one thing that's old and you still traditionally, it's your go-to because you trust it and you like it? Okay, so we're talking about me personally, like the biggest yeah, technological yeah, change I in want. Like society. Okay, yeah. So when I first started doing expeditions in the wilderness, I had a shoestring budget, so all of the best gear was completely beyond 